Hey guys, today I want to talk to you guys about why I became an art supply reviewer and what I see as my responsibilities as an art supply reviewer. So if you're new to my channel, a little bit of background on me. I am a comic artist and illustrator. I have a four-year degree in digital art from the University of New Orleans, Katrina class, and uh, I have a two-year Master's of Fine Art in Sequential Art from SCAD. So <laughs> I have my first degree in digital and my second degree in comics. And while I was at SCAD, I really fell in love with art supplies. And it's because I made the acquaintance of someone who had started out as an illustration major and became a comics MFA with me at the same time, my friend Heidi, who had a very different educational background than I did and was able to teach me a lot of what they had learned during their undergrad. While I was in undergrad, um, we were still suffering the deprivations of Hurricane Katrina in our department. So access to art supplies was kind of limited. And a lot of our local art supply stores had gone out of business, leaving mostly Michaels, which those of you who have access to art supply stores other than Michaels, you know Michaels is very limited. Michaels is very expensive. The staff often can't really help you with what you're looking for. I also come from a family who are interested in art, but are not artists themselves. They didn't have the means to pursue formal art education. And so while they encouraged me and they bought the best art supplies that they knew to buy for a child artist, I didn't really have access to nice art supplies or anything approaching even student grade until I had graduated with my first degree. So uh, when Heidi introduced me to the world of Copic markers and watercolor and really nice art supplies, and we had access to, I think it was a primary art supplies first, then they built a U-Track, then Blick came in. So we had a series of art supply stores while I lived in Savannah, Georgia. It really just fueled this desire to try out different art supplies and to share what I found with my friends. We would have these art supply parties where everybody would bring something, whether it was dip pens and ink, or it was Copic markers, it was watercolor, and we would all just take turns playing with these art supplies and teaching each other tricks that we had learned and sharing information that we had found. I also came up on the internet when, I mean, we've talked about this in other artist talks, so I don't wanna like get into the weeds, but. I kind of came up with the internet where there wasn't a lot in terms of art education and tutorials for a really, really long time. And then the art blog exploded. And so many artists would not only share their sketches, but they would share their favorite materials and they would review their favorite materials. And that was hugely influential and inspiring for me. So while I was at SCAD, I started the Natto Soup Studio blog to kind of share my experiences, share my education and share the materials that I was falling in love with. And that blog kind of morphed into this relatively small, but I think fairly close knit little YouTube channel where it gives me a chance to talk to you guys, sometimes face to face about art supplies that bring me joy, art supplies that have made a difference in my own artistic practice and art supplies that I felt were a waste of money and I would recommend that other artists skip. I do always try to make sure you guys are aware that I'm viewing this from the lens of a comic artist. I do a specific kind of art, I do a specific kind of watercolor, and while I think everyone should learn to love comics, cartoons, and illustration, I recognize that for many people it doesn't make their heart sing, it's not the kind of art that they're interested in, and that my reviews might not be valuable to them. I have reviewed all kinds of art supplies. I spent years reviewing different brands of alcohol markers. Most of that was done over on the blog. And then I kind of fell in love with watercolor as I was painting Seven Inch Kara, but I became very frustrated with the limitations that student grade had to offer. And I became very frustrated by the limitations that inexpensive papers had to offer. So I kind of started this journey 
of reviewing different watercolors to see what was a good fit for me. And it's just kind of morphed out from there. So as a reviewer, my very first obligation is to myself. Um, I have bought things that I knew were going to be junk and I hated it. And those reviews always kind of show that. Um, I've had friends send me bad things knowing it would be funny to watch me give a big negative reaction to them. And that's fun and that has its place, but it's caused me to burn out over the years. So generally I try to the best of my ability to only spend my money on art supplies I think I will like or art supplies I think my students would like. So when I review inexpensive alcohol markers, I'm thinking about my teenage students when I'm reviewing those markers. I'm trying to look at it through an affordability and accessibility lens, a price point that they can, you know, talk their parents, grandparents, guardians into maybe giving a shot for something that they may or may not like five years from now. So my main priority when I'm purchasing art supplies is to try to find the next thing I will fall in love with. And that has led me to some interesting corners of the internet. We have spent a lot of time on AliExpress. Reviewing art supplies has led me to examine my own biases, my own beliefs, and my own education, and look for ways that I can continue to learn and grow as an artist outside of comics. My next obligation is to my audience. I have gotten a bit of a reputation over the years for being mean, for being snarky, but also for being honest. And that is a reputation. The mean and the snarky I don't love, but the honest really means a lot to me. As an ADHD girl who is often misunderstood, clarity and being seen for who I am and what I'm trying to do is really important to me. But I also was raised by people who, this is so nerdy to say, really valued reviews. I was raised by a grandfather who felt like if a restaurant gave bad service, he owed it to the waiter to explain what was going on to give them a chance to improve. I grew up with a subscription to consumer reports in my house and I remember reading it from a very young age. I think being able to provide to the best of my ability as a fellow consumer, useful information that other consumers can use when they are purchasing their own art supplies, I think that's important and I enjoy being able to do it. it. My audience, those of you who watch my reviews, whether you are here for the first time or you hang out with me regularly, it is important to me to be as honest with you guys as I can be. To when I love something, to sing its praises and to make it clear that I love and recommend these things. When I dislike something, to articulate why I don't like it and to find points that you can compare so that you can decide whether that's a breaking or a making point for you. Maybe I don't like very opaque watercolors for a particular reason, but you're looking for that. Maybe I do a lot of really translucent glazes, but you're not looking for that. You want that immediate mass tone payoff. We have different needs. And while I'm here representing to the best of my ability, the comics and illustration community, I recognize that I cannot represent all artists, nor would I want to. I just want to be a voice for my own fairly underrepresented subsect of artists, particularly because I teach and I teach young artists and a lot of them want to go into games, they want to go into comics, they want to go into illustration, they want to go into storytelling, and there just isn't a lot out there to help them along their way. I absolutely do not owe any obligation or loyalty to companies. I don't owe any obligation or loyalty to from people that I've purchased supplies from other than to just be as honest as I can and try to be fair to what they've done. I can only work with the information provided and honestly with the way the internet is going these days unless you pack that information into your product it can be really hard for me to find and while I will dig somewhat for it I don't want every video to turn into a deep dive where I had to spend three weeks researching a particular palette. I feel like you should include that. And I'm pointing to the Paul Rubens palette over here because while they do provide some information and some brochures, 
considering this is their new G4 palette and they're claiming it's better than their past palettes, they have provided no information as to how. So um, that would be a really good example of, I can only pass along information that I have access to. You guys see we're about to reach 20K subscribers at the time of recording this. Thank you guys so much, by the way. It really means a lot to me. 20K was my big goal. And I'm really glad that you guys have joined me for this ride. But I'm not a huge YouTuber. I don't have a lot of influence. I don't get sent a lot of PR stuff. I don't have access to touring different art manufacturer sites. I don't have behind the scenes access to different art supply stores. I have very similar access to what many of you guys have. And I think that offers an interesting perspective because just like y'all are consumers who are interested in whether this product is a good fit for you or not, I am in the exact same boat. The only difference between me and you is I have reviewed hundreds of watercolor palettes, I think. I haven't done the count. It sure has felt with the student grade showdown, it sure felt like thousands of palettes. And I know that's not the case, but I have reviewed a lot of palettes. I've reviewed a lot of student grade. I've reviewed a lot of AliExpress. I have reviewed a lot of white labeled from other companies. I have reviewed a lot of professional grade. I have reviewed watercolors from Japan. I have reviewed watercolors made in the US. I have reviewed a lot of watercolors from China. So what differentiates me from you is I have reviewed all of these different palettes and possibly the fact that I have painted hundreds of comic pages. So I have put a lot of paint on paper over the years, but for all I know, you have painted thousands of pages of children's book illustrations and you have a unique perspective to add here as well. And whether you choose to share it in the comments or share it over on my Discord or make your own channel, I think that's cool and I think that if you have that unique perspective, you should definitely share it. I am not one of those artists who thinks other artists not sharing every aspect of their life is gatekeeping. I do not think other artists should have to share tutorials. I don't think other artists should have to share their materials. I do wish other artists with a social media platform would share who their influences and their inspirations are, particularly the ones who claim to be self-taught, but I cannot compel them to do so. All I can do is wish for those things and try to be the other party that does talk about my inspirations and what I enjoy and what artists I look up to and what art supplies I like and to share tutorials. The one thing I would, I do wish is that other artists who are frustrated by people constantly asking them for tutorials and for what supplies they would use, I just wish they would point them in the direction of people like me who do those things. We're doing that part of the job so you don't have to and it would just help both of us. But basically I review art supplies because I love art supplies. I love the way they make me feel. I find watercolor to be incredibly grounding, very comforting, very calming when I am painting with good paints, whether it is Mei Liang, which is a student grade paint, or if I am painting with Da Vinci, which is an American made high quality professional paint. I love the way watercolor makes me feel. I love the way making cute art and illustration makes me feel. I love the way when I complete a commission, a portrait commission for someone and they start to cry with joy. I love the way that makes me feel. Art and art supplies, especially good art supplies. And by good, good is so subjective. Good is good to you. It's what you like to use. It's what brings your joy and what makes your heart sing. That has just been such a gift in my life that brings me so much joy and it allows me to communicate with others in a way that sometimes I struggle to communicate. Sometimes it can be hard to get over the rejection sensitivity dysphoria when somebody um, out of the blue doesn't like something I made, doesn't like one of my reviews, doesn't like an art piece that I made. Um, that can hurt but art also allows me to put some salve on that wound and to find joy in living another day. So I hope that my reviews can help you guys find those art supplies for you. And you don't have to like what I like. You don't have to hate what I hate. This is not that kind of a club. Um, we are not all wearing pink on Wednesdays. It is technically a Wednesday and I am wearing this. 
you are welcome to bring your own enjoyment and your own pleasure and your own favorites to this conversation because the really beautiful thing about artists and art supplies is that we all love different things and we all have different uses for these things but while i feel that way and i am sure i have failed in this myself because i am only human i do try to be particular about certain terminology because certain phrases in terms of art supplies mean certain things and i don't want to confuse those of you who watch my stuff and some of you have been generous enough to point out in the comments when i misspoke and i appreciate that because it gives others an opportunity to learn when i might have been inaccurate and as long as we can do that respectfully i encourage it because yo i have adhd and i'm gonna make mistakes and i don't pretend to be the number one authority on any of this i am still learning as much as anybody else is i just don't mind turning a camera and dressing up like like a hobbit and uh talking about these things with you guys i think that's the big difference and just having done this for years like i think a lot of people think that they can uh talk about art supplies on the internet and you can but it's the sticking to it through the 10 views on a video that you spent two weeks on through the 50 views on a video that you spent two weeks on it's the sticking through the suck that i think a lot of people struggle with and y'all i am in comics C comics has a lot of bad days in case you're not aware so I am just uniquely made to stick through the suck and to stick through the bad times. But I really just kind of wanted to share my thoughts on why I review art supplies and who my loyalties are to. I have reviewed things from Dollar Tree. I review things from Walmart. I review things from Five Below and Michaels. I review things from AliExpress and Amazon and from my favorite local brick and mortar store and from Jackson's and from Blick. I am agnostic towards brands. If I think something looks promising and interesting, I will probably give it a try. And if it is fun, I will probably say so, even if the way it's manufactured is not up to general professional standards. But I do also think talking about professional quality materials, materials that will last I don't mean 100 years. Anyone who's watched me has, knows I don't want my art to last 200 years. Please don't put it in the museum, please. I, two years, we're talking two years, we're talking five years. If you sell a commission and it goes on someone's wall, it shouldn't fade within 10 years of them having purchased it. Like that is not great. And there are artists, myself included, who do alcohol marker commissions and alcohol markers are fugitive. And our customer base is aware of this and they know it. I have spent good money on alcohol marker commissions knowing that if I put it in sunlight, it's going to fade. So there is kind of a, a push and pull between using the materials that will stand up to the job that you're doing and not just fall apart, but also having a customer base that understands the limitations of the art form that you're working with and understands how to display it so that it continue to look beautiful or it can continue to speak to their heart for as long as possible. And I do think as artists, and I particularly think as teaching artists who are selling these sort of things, we do owe it to our audience to be very honest about that. I don't think that makes you a mean person or a snarky person or a bad person because who is my number one priority with these reviews? Myself. Who is my number one, number one, number two priority with these reviews? It's you guys. It's being honest with you guys and talking to you guys like I would talk to my friends. And I'm not gonna lie to my friends about supplies that I didn't like or that I think would have been a waste of their money because I care about my friends and all of my friends live on limited income and cannot afford to waste money on art supplies that are not gonna be able to do what they need it to do. So in the beginning of Seven Inch Kara, I struggled along with Canton student paper using cotton and student watercolors because I didn't yet know what worked for me. And I found that that did not work for me. Eventually, I found that for painting my comic pages, using Canton Montval with professional grade paints is a better way of working for me. It's a good 
kind of torn, tossed between economical paper that can do what I need it to do and paints that are going to be able to do what I need them to do and to last longer. They're not going to be as full of fillers and binders the way cotton is. They're not going to be as full of extenders. They're not going to get used up as quickly and I can work with a smaller amount of paint to paint more pages and end up with a result that I like better and that I can control better. But that is not to say that if you enjoy Canton student and you enjoy Cotman, you are a bad artist. It is just my own preferences, what I have found that works and what doesn't work over the years. So I hope you guys will continue to join me for these art supply reviews. I hope you guys will continue to find my watercolor reviews to be helpful, useful, and informative. And I hope you guys will please, if you haven't yet, because I have noticed that a lot of people who just dismiss my reviews whole cloth have actually not looked at my art. They're not really looking at any of the things that I produce. I would love it if you would take a look over at my Instagram or check out my TikTok or check out my web comic. And that'll kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from. I grew up as a lower class girl in Southeast Louisiana. So like I, my access to art supplies was so limited and it has been such a big, bright and wonderful world. But I have spent a lot of money on a lot of garbage that made me very sad over the years. And if I can help you guys avoid those things, if I can share some guidance and some pointers that will help you buy the art supplies that you love, that's exactly the kind of legacy that I would like to leave. I mean, first of all, I'd like to leave a legacy of making heartwarming, charming, and sweet watercolor comics that feature ADHD characters. Like that is hugely meaningful to me. That is the number one legacy that I would like to leave. But bearing that, I would like to be remembered as your artist friend who helped you find supplies that you really like and maybe helped you hone some of your art skills along the way. So that's my little artist chat on why I review art supplies, kind of what I'm looking at when I review art supplies, although I didn't get into that as much as I would have liked. It's kind of a nuanced issue and it really kind of varies a lot on where I bought it, who I'm reviewing this, who I have in mind when I'm reviewing this what market are they marketing to because i'm not going to hold five below supplies to the same standard that i hold michael's supplies to to the same standard that i'm going to hold blick supplies to right those are all different markets who all have different needs and the more you guys talk to me when we do lives when we do premieres and in the paint box and the more i get to know what you're looking for the more i can expand my own horizons and find supplies that i think you guys might genuinely like and be able to get over to overcome my watercolor comic artist bias just a little bit to see what might be appealing for you guys and to talk about more of that here on the channel. I have friends from South America who have pointed out that they can't access art supplies from Amazon necessarily. So I started reviewing more things from AliExpress. So the more you guys talk to me and the more you share what your interests are and what you're looking for, the more I can expand my own horizons here. But Typically, when I am reviewing watercolor specifically, I am either looking for a good affordable watercolor that I could recommend to my students and that they could paint what they imagine with some instruction, but minimal struggle. They're not going to have to learn how to overcome the shortcomings of cheap paints. And when I am reviewing watercolors that are professional or claim to be professional, I am legitimately looking at how do these colors mix? Is there a lot of optical brightener that might make this muddy? Do the colors fall apart as we mix them or as we add water? Are they dye-based watercolors in that you can just tell there's weird color separations that are not from granulation? Are they gonna fade very quickly? Do they look like they've had fluorescence added to them? Typically when companies are trying to make their watercolors less expensive for them, they're going to use more extenders. They're going to go with dye-based paint. So sometimes lake pigments, that can be something to look for. Lake pigments are just dyes that have been mordanted out onto a substrate. They may use more binder to really extend and stretch out that paint. And they may use optical brighteners to make the paints look more appealing, to look brighter in mass tone. But what that results in is very muddy mixes. It results in paints that don't lift the way they ought to. It results in paints that fall apart. If you try to do a wash with them, they have very low tinting strength. 
it results in paints that don't really handle glazing or other common watercolor techniques very well. So you're very limited to what kind of techniques you can do with those paints. And while those kind of paints might work for certain applications, they're not going to work for watercolor comics and they're not going to work for watercolor illustration, at least the way that I do it. So that's generally what I'm looking for when I'm reviewing art supplies. I do a series of tests. We have the swatch test where we have a mass tone and then we have a gradiated wash. And I do it over a couple of black stripes to test the opacity as well. So I'm looking at granulation, I'm looking at staining, I'm looking at color separation, I'm looking at how the paints glob up on the brush or don't, I'm looking at color control. Um, I am comparing the mass tone which is like the, the most saturated you can get with the color swatch to the pile color that is the paint in mass in the half pan or in a pile. I also do a lift test after those have dried where I try to lift it up. You should see some variance in good quality paints. Some colors are gonna be more staining. Some colors are going to be more granulating. More granulating colors are typically going to be more lifting. And lifting is a useful property in watercolor, one that we use frequently when we're making corrections. Um, I do color mixing, where I take primary colors and mix secondary colors, and I compare how the colors look while they're still very wet to how the colors look after they've dried. Have they dulled significantly? Some dulling is normal. Significant dulling, color shifting, color lightening, graying out is not normal. Weird granulation and scaling are also not normal, and they can become apparent when you start mixing colors. I also do what I call a wet into wet test, where I apply a bunch of water, and then I dab in the color and I just kind of see how they mix and how they move and how they intersperse in the water. I don't like watercolors that basically just stick, stick, stick where you put them. I want that wet into wet diffusion. Now there are some professional grade brands that fail some of these options and succeed winningly at others. So this is not like, I'm not a fan of Schminka for these reasons. A lot of the like German brands I don't really love for this these, these kind of problems um, and some Japanese brands are so finely milled that you won't get granulation from colors that typically would granulate like ultramarine blue typically granulates and then you have some brands where the granulation is overwhelming and overly apparent like Daniel Smith's ultramarine blue is a little too granulating for my use so this is also why when I'm painting myself, I have that giant palette with colors from all sorts of different brands because I have picked out the colors that have the properties that I like best for the kind of watercolor that I do. So when it comes to my own personal and professional work, I am fairly brand agnostic. When it comes to reviewing professional grade paints, in general, I will try to include a field test with the review, either in that review or after that review where I'm painting an illustration in the same way that I would paint any other illustration. And I am almost always painting on a professional grade pa paper. I was painting on Stonehenge, but it won't release the blue lines from my new printer the way I would like. So I've been painting on Moulin de Roy, which I love, but Moulin de Roy is hard. <laughs> it's discontinued. So I'm moving back over to Arches, but I always paint my field tests on a high grade, well-respected, 100% um, cotton watercolor paper. I do all of my swatch testing on Blix cotton rag, Blick Premier cotton rag block bound paper. And that's what I do all of my swatching on, whether it's a professional grade or an inexpensive grade, it's kind of my default. Um, it's kind of expensive to use. I would compare it to Arches. I also paint on Blick and I really like Blick. Um, it's just a little bit cheaper and a little bit more like the blocks are cheaper than an arches block so they're just a little more accessible for me to do this kind of mass testing that gets incredibly expensive to do but i do try to standardize certain elements i always work with filtered kentwood water from our water filter it's the same water that i drink and that i give to my pets so that it doesn't because we have hard water down here so i don't want calcium and mineral deposits to be a factor that might throw off a paint review so i always use filtered water for my paint reviews i work in general unless i disclose otherwise for reasons 
mentioned in that review, I work with watercolor brushes I love. So I am working with Paul Rubin's quills. I am working with the Diane W. quills. I am working with silver black velvet rounds, the silver black velvet flat. This is what I paint with. So the brushes are a constant as well. I use my little Faber-Castell click and go cup, cups, the same ones that I use in um, when I'm painting comic pages or illustrations. If I'm working with tube watercolors, I swatch fresh from the tube and then I set them up in half pans and test how they reconstitute because I've gotten burned with Daniel Smith's Mayan Blue and the fact that once it's dry, it's dry. It is not reactivating. Some paints genuinely function better from tubes. Do I have the money when I'm reviewing professional grade to buy one of every color? No, and I don't have the desire to do that either. What I will typically do is I will either buy a test set. So some companies like PwC offers um, a less expensive test set that you can get a feel for their colors. Sennelier does as well. And then I will also purchase basic colors if they're not included in the test set. And what I mean by that is a warm red, a cool red, a warm yellow, a cool yellow, ultramarine blue and a phthalo blue, a sap green, a burnt sienna, a yellow ochre. The colors that I typically need to be able to paint Kara, like the character I paint the most. Um, even if she's not always who I'm painting in my field test, those are the colors that I will go and buy and I will use that as kind of a gauge. So I really love when companies, professional companies have mixing sets or they have test sets or they have like a basics set because I can't afford to go and buy every color a brand has to see if I like that brand, but I can afford to buy a test set and kind of get a feel for the brand and then go out and buy things open stock as I find that I need those colors. Also, when I am reviewing watercolors, I will set them up in individual uh, half pan tins that are labeled. And if I want to add them to my daily driver palette, I will just fill a separate half pan and add that. And that way I have kind of my control versus, you know, what I have that I like to paint with. So I have all of these homemade palettes that I've made from tubes that um, they kind of just stay in those palettes for the purposes of review. And should I ever stop reviewing watercolors, I will probably just condense them all down. Um, I don't refill those half pans typically though. I'll refill my daily driver half pan from that tube, but once it's done, it's probably done. Um, I used to buy the Meaden tins and that's expensive. So what I buy now is like um, Amazon pencil cases, like just the plain undecorated metal pencil cases. And I buy my half pans in bulk. I don't even attempt to do a full fill when I'm making a test set. It is literally just enough for me to test it and to do a field test. And um, that way I'm not wasting a huge amount of paint. Um, my husband would tell you guys that I have a paint hoard. I do have a paint hoard. It is not as massive as some artists paint hoards. I'm really not looking to be an art supply museum. Um, I will liquidate when I'm finished with a series, I will liquidate palettes that weren't for me, or if I know somebody who would benefit from that palette more. So when I moved from Nashville, I got rid of about 30 student grade watercolor palettes by uh, donating them to my students, putting them in little libraries, giving them to Goodwill, giving them to uh, my mother-in-law wanted some of them. So like when I'm done with a series, if I don't have a use for those paints, I will try to liquidate them. Um, sending them off to friends. <laughs> so um, I really want, even if it's an art supply I don't love, I want them to continue to live and to be conti to continue to be used. Now, there's some stuff I bought during the student grade showdown that I, I wouldn't wish it on my enemies. Like some of that stuff is genuinely terrible. So what I will do in those instances is gut the palette and reuse it for other paints because like something I think about a lot is that this kind of reviewing things can have the tendency to generate a lot of waste. In the end, our goal is less waste. Our goal is helping people find things they like that are economical, that meet their needs in, you know, genuinely meet their needs. So in the end, people are buying less crap that they don't want and they're having things that they really do enjoy. That's the goal. But I realize that I have such a small footprint 
on this space that I am probably not as efficient in that goal as I'd like to kid myself. So um, it's also about finding ways to try to reduce the waste and to reduce the consumption or if I am going to do this to buy from my local brick and mortar and to support local businesses. So um, a couple points have been brought up. Uh, someone pointed out I don't review a lot of handmade watercolors and someone pointed out I don't review comics. Uh, first off, don't crap where you eat. Uh, so I am a comic artist. I have no interest in reviewing comics. Like that is not my jam. That is not, I don't enjoy doing that. I don't, I like reviewing the art books, but I don't like giving starred reviews and I don't do Goodreads, right? Um, if I like a comic, I will tell you guys and I will recommend it and I will loan it out to my friends. But if I didn't like a comic, unless I found it harmful and hurtful, I'm probably just going to not talk much about it because like I have really specific taste for what I like. Like I don't like capes or superheroes basically at all, right? Like then that makes me kind of weird. So I just generally don't review comics like at all. We buy a lot of comics, we support indie, but in general, I'm not going to review them because I know I have weird taste. So if you see a comic review from me, it's because I really, really enjoyed the comic. As for handmade watercolors, I do review them from time to time, but because they are not a mass produced product, I genuinely feel bad holding them to the same standards that I hold the products that I, that are like mass produced. Um, I recognize as someone who hand makes a lot of the things she sells that there are going to be problems in the manufacturing. There's going to be problems in acquiring materials. There's all of these hiccups and hurdles that can change the quality of a product, that can change the price of a product, that can change what you have access to when you're making the product. So in general, I prefer not to review handmade watercolors. Um, I like taking a look at them. I have a friend who makes watercolors and she'll send me watercolors from time to time and I, I like to swatch them for you guys, but like I'm not going to review them the same way I would review a mass market product or something that's being mass produced. And I'm not going to review them at that same scale either because to be absolutely frank, most handmade watercolors are more opaque than I would want for my comics. So I recognize the bias that I would have from the get-go. I am also not big on special effects watercolors like mica and metallics because I work for reproduction primarily and that is the big market for watercolors so I am just not a good fit to review handmade watercolors. Just I can recognize the biases from a mile off and I opt not to review them. I also probably will not review review art supplies that a friend has released or has a friend's name on them because I know I'm biased. I may talk about them and do like a demo of them, but I don't ever plan on doing like a solid review of someone who I know on a personal level stuff because that would be disingenuous to you guys. Like I know I would be biased towards my friend and I would want to support my friend and I would rather just be like, hey, this isn't a review. We're just demoing these fun things that I bought from my friend rather than trying to pass it off as like, this is a fair and unbiased review of somebody whose stuff that I don't know. Now to talk about the white elephant in the room. And yes, I'm mixing my idioms. My easily influenced series. This is such a, a ball of emotions. So on the one hand, I am a fan and I am a consumer. I like looking at art. I like looking at pretty art. It is very easy to talk me into buying something if I like your art and that's what you're using. Like it is so easy. Like we talked earlier about how I got into art supplies. It was a friend showing me like what cool things they liked and me getting to try them. So like I am primed to be easily influenced by other artists who I look up to. Conversely, a lot of my audience is in the same camp and they've tried stuff I didn't try, but many of them are picking up art again. They're newer to art. And sometimes it's like, Hey, is this product not good? Or is it, am I bad at art? And they'll send it to me. And that kind of started this interest for me in like 
figuring out if the art supplies that a popular artist is selling and hawking and putting their name on and like allowing to be attached with their identity, if those supplies are genuinely as good as they say they are, like are they concerned about wrecking the reputation with bad art supplies? Or is this a way to make money or is it somewhere in between? Like the nosy part of me had to know. And as an art teacher who, and I've talked about this in other uh, artist talks, I've cleaned up the mess that art influencers have made. Um, and this was pointed out to me like in the Jane Davenport review that she does teach in-person classes. Um, the difference is when I'm teaching in-person classes and there's some exceptions, I'm getting ran, I'm getting randos. Like they don't know who I am. I don't know who they are. Um, they wanted to take a class on painting flowers. I happen to be taking the class on painting flowers. Um, in St. Charles Parish, it was starting to be like, a, oh, Miss Becca's teaching this. I want to take a class with Miss Becca. But in general, my in-person classes, they don't know who I am. There's no name recognition there. They're not seeing me on Instagram or YouTube and then taking a class with me. So I clean up a lot of mess from other influential artists. I, I answer a lot of misinformation. I have to explain that self-taught doesn't actually mean you never look anything up, you never use reference, you don't read books. It's really kind of a misnomer. So like when I started the Easily Influenced series, it was to answer my own curiosity. It was because as somebody who has made art content on the internet for a long time, would I be interested in doing a paint deal if a company approached me? And if so, with who? Or would I not touch this beehive with a 20 foot pole because I've already shaken up those bees? Um, would I do a book? And if I did a book, who would I want to be published with? And what would I want the book to contain? And what are other artists already writing about? And do I want to cover the same ground they're writing? So easily influenced is like one part, just nosy curiosity, one part market research as someone who is maybe smaller, but in a similar field of work. Um, and then also one part the art teacher in me wants to know for those of you who watch my stuff because you find it educational, those of you who watch my stuff because you're as nosy as I am and you have to know and I'm the one scratching the itch for you like we think along the same line so if I like it you'll like it and if I don't like it you probably won't like it. Um, and also so I can talk to my students when they bring these things up because people will ask me like hey, did you watch so-and-so's video on this particular technique where they use this brush? What do you think of that brush? Do you use this technique? I wanna be able to talk to them about it. Or like when I'm doing a live or if I'm doing a premiere, people will bring up other people's videos and ask if I'm familiar with it and I wanna be familiar with it. Like I like being in the know and I like being savvy and I avoided this for a really long time because I had just assumed that this was just brand deal stuff. Like I lived through the makeup drama of the late 20, 20 teens. Um, so I'd gotten it in my head that a lot of these brand partnerships, unless I already liked the brand, were just, just for making money. Um, so Easily Influenced has introduced me to some books that I really enjoy and that I heavily recommend to some of my students. It's also recommended or also introduced me to a lot of paints that I didn't like. But it's also introduced me to just some interesting concepts in terms of making kits and branding and presenting yourself on the internet. And this is such a hard series to do because I, I came from being harsh on big brands, right? So I had to do like a tonal shift. Like these are people we're talking about. We're not talking about, Brea Reese is not a person, but Josie Lewis is, right? So like I had to learn to shift how I talked about these things because the brands just ignore me. I don't exist to them, but to these people, they have Google searches on their name. Like it's gonna come up and I am not looking to hurt anybody or make any enemies. So it's been really an interesting tightrope because, you know, anything I say, that finger could be pointed back at me in three years if Core ever calls me back. You know, 
I'm just kidding. I've never, I would love to, but I've never actually serious pitched core. Um, how, how do you improve on the perfection that is the mini palette, right? Like just put my name on that. Okay, core, we're good. Anyway, um, like I realize, like everything I say, that spotlight's going to be back at me when I release my watercolor book. Like if I do not deliver, even if I do deliver, I am setting a tone and it is really interesting and really fun and it is terrifying. I have so much anxiety every time I do the Easily Influenced series because I love taking a look at what these artists are making and how they present themselves, but I don't want to like dig, right? This is not a deep dive. This is not tea. I don't care about their personal lives. I don't want to talk about their personal lives. I'm interested in how they present themselves and market themselves as an artist who they're working with and if that's a viable option for me and how they handle their online persona because that's an area of growth for me. Um, I'm also interested in, did they do a book? Who did they do a book with? How is this book laid out? How easy is it, is it to follow along with this book? Does this book just cover the same stuff everybody else covered or does it introduce new topics? I love when they introduce new topics. Is this book, I'm gonna throw Josie under the bus and I really like Josie's book is her book should have been just essays on how Josie Lewis thinks with her art because I would have eaten that with a spoon. I want more of that more, please, Josie. I like how you think. Um, or does this book never get into the artist's head and you never see how they think and it's really hard to kind of learn to see the, the world through their eyes. Um, and then we have the paints, which is, like it's both my favorite part because it's what I do and it's my bread and butter talking about paints, but it's also terrifying because um, that's where I'm the most likely to get snarky and to forget myself and to talk about these like these were manufactured by like Windsor and Newton and I can hold them to Windsor and Newton standards. And it's honestly easier when it's a collab, right? Like with Mare Marie Blue, because if I don't like Mare Marie Blue, I just don't like Mare Marie Blue. It's not personal to the artist. It's not Jenna Rainey. It's not Jeannie Dixon. I just didn't like Mare Marie Blue. Whereas when it's something they have white labeled or that they've worked with a manufacturer, it can seem very personal. But that's why I talk to you guys about who are my priorities, right? Like first, I'm not buying anything I think I won't like. That said, it is so easy to hype me into something I won't like. It's so easy to get me to buy something that is not everything it promises to be. And like, let's be real. Um, most of these listings online promise you the moon and back. They do. They promise that they can teach you to watercolor in one month or they, that these watercolors will change your life or that these brushes are going to change how you look at painting. And like, it's all, there's some exceptions. I'm sure. Um, I fell in love with Da Vinci watercolors. They are my favorite mixing set. You know, like there's some exceptions, but most, mostly it's fluff. And, um, there's something about me and my ADHD where I don't deal well with that kind of fluff. I would rather have pigment information and examples of the swatches and examples of what you painted with it than you tell me that in two weeks I'll be painting gorgeous florals just like you do. Like I don't deal well with that. Um, and I have found that a lot of you guys don't deal well with that either. A lot of us would rather concise information than to be sold a dream. And maybe that's an area where my channel has fallen because I am not here to sell you a dream. I cannot, I cannot tell you how to be a professional artist. I can talk about some of the things I've done that work for me and some of the things that fail for me, but I can't tell you how to do it. I can't tell you what product is going to be your number one bestseller because unless I know you and I know your art and I know your audience and I know the part of the country you're selling at and I know who you're going to manufacture that product with, I just don't know. And rather than pretend I can talk to things that I cannot talk to because there's too many variables in this world. I would rather just share my experiences and be honest and straightforward with you guys from my own little bubble of the world. And that doesn't sell, I have noticed. I could tell you guys that Seven Inch Kara is the ADHD comic that is gonna change how your ADHD child sees, about, sees themselves. It is gonna teach your ADHD child to love themselves. And I would sincerely love if that happened, but I cannot promise that, so I cannot say that. You know, and maybe that's like a me thing and I get really, the neurodivergent just gets real caught on that. 
promises we can't afford to keep. Um, but it has made the Easily Influenced series really hard and interesting and fun because while you could say that about your art, you can talk about your gorgeous florals and you can talk about your product design, you can talk about art like that because art is subjective, you have to be careful about that with like products that we can test and review and that our experiences might be wildly different. And I, uh, reading through some comments, on another YouTuber I admire. These were comments about me. A couple people that I've encountered commented like how the series makes them feel like they both enjoy it, but it gives them the ick. And like, <laughs> me and you, but bestie, like it gives both of us the ick. I wish every book I bought, I wish every paint I bought for this series was wonderful. I wish I could full chest just sing their praises. That would make this easy for me. This would be easy. I would be everybody's best friend. No one would be mad at Becca. Like it would be easy to do that. It would be, um, it would just make my life good. You know what I mean? Like people would want to collab with me. They would say my name. I wouldn't be that invisible person, but like I, I can't unless those books are all that, unless those paints are all that, unless, they really make me happy and I can see myself painting my comic with it or I can see my friend who's learning watercolor having a blast with these paints or I can see my students enjoying them. I can't do that. I just cannot because my first priority is to myself and my second priority is to you guys. So like I as and I like this series, like even if it gives me the it, I have fun doing I have fun reading the books. I have fun testing out the paints. I have fun seeing how other artists think about things. What I, what gives me the anxiety is the sharing it online where it can, people can find it tremendously helpful or people can just be like, Becca's being a wooden spoon again. She's just saying stuff to get attention again. Like, and y'all, 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 my most viewed easily influ influenced video top, it's like at under 2K views. Like, you know what I mean? It's been out for months. Like. I just don't have that kind of impact, right? Like I might have cost you, in fact, for one of these videos that I'm thinking of, I'm not going to say one, I'm not going to say who, I might have cost them sales of their paints, but I made them sales on their books and on some of the pottery that they're selling and some of their art prints, you know? So like, it's weird. It's weird and a little scary, especially for somebody like me who uh, grew up hearing if you don't, if you live, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So basically anything I might be pointing out about somebody else, that's three fingers that could easily be pointed back at me. And I'm aware of that. And that's terrifying. Um, but also like, I promise to do my best not to ever lie to you guys. So um, it's interesting. And I love it and I hate it. And I need to take a little bit of a break from it because it got kind of heated. So I'm just gonna be reviewing mass market art supplies for a while and maybe doing more tutorials. And on that note, um, and I know we've talked about this a lot, like those of you who are OG Data Soup Studio fans, y'all know a lot of my content for years and years and years and years and years was tutorials and tutorials and tutorials and tutorials. And, tutorials. and that's still there. Like I didn't get rid of that. If you want to learn how to draw, I got you. If you want to learn how to paint, I got you. Like I have this backlog of art education, comics education, making zines, doing conventions. That's all there. You please watch, please watch it. But if tutorials are your preference over reviews, talk to me and tell me and I'm happy to do that because I like doing art educational content. I like doing the reviews but like I also like making things for you guys and you watching it like I did a tutorial on making this mushroom crown and it's so cute right? So um like if reviews are not like where you resonate with me it's not like what you love about what I do I do still do tutorials and I need to mention this um I have been sharing time-lapse watercolor videos of some of my backlog because I record like everything but I don't voice over everything um I've been sharing that as I'm learning how to use Premiere go me to my patrons and I have been doing photo and written 
tutorial-esque, not like full-blown tutorial, but like talking about certain techniques that I use or something that I enjoy doing. I've been sharing that as a backer exclusive on Patreon and I really want to like keep doing that. I love doing that and pick up the pace with that. So like if you're looking for more written um, video and written stuff, I got you over on Patreon. Um, it's just easier to do it over there. And um, honestly, Google kind of destroyed Blogspot, so I just can't really post there anymore. It's just too annoying to be able to post there. But anyway, I just kind of wanted to talk to you guys about some of the things I think about when I'm reviewing art supplies, some of the things I'm looking for, some of the pain points. I wanted to address some of the chatter that I have seen. Um, and I, I genuinely do not know what the future holds for this channel. And I'm kind of okay with that. Um, this is not really like my livelihood. This is my hobby. And I don't really make a lot of money doing this. And it all goes back into buying art supplies. So like the plus side to that is when it's not fun anymore, I can just quit. The downside to that is when it's not fun anymore, I'm probably going to quit. So, um, I enjoy getting to chat with you guys. I had so much fun recording this, even though I ran out of room on my camera three times, hence the awkward transitions. And uh, it was fun to make a little set and to get all dressed up and to have like the rainy vibes in the background. I just enjoyed this. And um, I can only do this when I'm in like a good mental health spot. I ran out of space again and Joseph mentioned that I cursed it by mentioning it and he's 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 spot on about it but anyway I miss doing these artist chats with you guys hopefully as the weather warms back up I will feel like just talking to you guys again because I miss you guys and um, I know I haven't been doing as many live streams and I know y'all miss them and I miss them and we need to work on that um, I have to like get over me feeling like I should be making art while doing a live stream because like y'all Y'all, the ADHD, I cannot talk, draw, and chew gum at the same time. Like, I just cannot. So, like, even just swatching watercolors for y'all, we can just hang out, enjoy one another's company, and have a nice cozy night. And I realize that. And um, as I have said for the past, I've said, as I've said since moving back to Louisiana, life has gotten really kind of hectic for me, and it's hard for me to predict sometimes. So, like, I just know that I miss that. I miss hanging out with you guys. But if you want to just, like, chat with me, you can always come chat in the paint box links down in the doodly doo um and if you're not like a discord person i do do premieres on the easily influenced and you absolutely do not have to talk about what we're talking about what i am talking about on the screen like you can just talk about whatever that is fine like you could just be like a fun little relaxing chatty hangout so i hope you guys have a wonderful day um, I look forward to seeing you guys again with another art supply review or tutorial. If you're a patron, keep an eye out for the time lapses with the written tutorials. Those are for y'all. I love you guys. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And I hope to see you guys again soon. Bye, guys.